story is told a long time ago about a man who worked as a lamplighter. It's back before there was electricity in all the uh, cities and towns and villages. And this man's job was to go through the village and light the lamps. And so he carried a stepladder with him and he would go and around dusk and start lighting these lamps. It was a snowy night and there was a young lad that was with his mom and they were walking down the main street. And as this lamplighter went ahead of them and turned down a side street and began to light the lamps, the young boy looked to his mother and he said, you can always tell where the lamplighter has been by the great avenue of light he leaves behind. I read that story a number of years ago, and I've always reflected on it and thought, isn't that how our lives ought to be? People can always tell where we've been because of the influence that we left behind. I'm going to read some scripture to you this morning, and you may say, what does it have to do with Memorial Day? Hang with me. Ecclesiastes 3, verses well, I was going to go 1 through 8. Uh, let's just go down to 5. There's a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down. A time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Father, it is indeed a privilege that each of us enjoy to be able to worship together in the freedoms that we have. May we never take them for granted. Would you anoint us today, speaker and hearer alike, as we look into your word and once again, revel in this great plan of salvation that you devised and designed for us. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage reminds us that there's a time for everything. At Nathan's graduation Friday night, one of the speakers mentioned uh, Charles Dickens' uh, play story. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. I remember sitting in class when that was assigned to us as a reading. And I thought that was the most ridiculous opening of a book that I've ever read. I didn't get it, but it was a study of contrasts. The Old Testament says there is a time for everything. I want to zero in on a time to gather stones and a time to scatter stones. Stones were used as markers in Bible times. Boundary markers, if you please. You could place a pile of stones and that was the edge of your land. Unscrupulous people would come along in the darkness of night and move those stones. Can you believe people would do that way back then? They did. And what they would do, they would gain more land for themselves, and you would have less. You know, the devil has been doing that to people ever since time began. He moves the boundaries. He steals from us. He takes for himself. People would know where your boundary was because of the stones that were there. The stones were important. I've had opportunity to be in the uh, National uh, Cemetery right here in, uh, where it is? Indian Town, Indian Town Gap, yes. This time of year, beautiful. When you talk about row upon row of stones and then the flags and other times when there's wreaths and it's just a beautiful place. But each one of those stones is a marker. 
On any given day, if you were to drive through that national cemetery, you'd see people out there looking at the stones, reading the markers, and at the same time reminiscing. See, when I was growing up, we didn't call what tomorrow is Memorial Day. It was always called Decoration Day. Because that was the day we went out and decorated the graves. And every time that we came to a grave, we, we learned a little bit of our history. My mother would say, there's Austin's grave. He was a baby that died before he was nine months old. My mother's brother. I never knew him. But I would hear stories about him. And then I never knew my grandfather, but I saw his grave. In the Old Testament, there was a time when Joshua was leading the people and, and they came to a river and they didn't know how they were going to get across when Joshua put his foot in the water and the waters parted and they were able to cross. And then you know what Joshua did? He said, take some stones. Everyone, take a stone. Put them over there on dry ground to mark the place where God delivered us. And when it comes time that later on you pass this way and your children say, what's with the stones? You could say, this is where God delivered us. And so my point today, this morning is, every one of us needs to establish some memorials yes. that our children can say, what does this mean? And we can say, that's where God met my heart. That's where God met with me. I was talking with somebody just this week and uh, they were dis discouraged. And I said, here's what you do. I want you to go back in your mind and share with me a time when you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, God met with you. And I said, then I want you to remember, that's the same God that we serve today. That's a marker. That's a memorial. Amen. Tomorrow is the day that we call Memorial Day. I'll never forget when we moved to the South, it was 1980 was quite a drastic change. In fact, a lot of people didn't think that we'd ever make it from the north, you know, moving south with the name of Sherman, you know. And, and But you know what? We, we just, we fit right in. At least we thought we did. If they didn't, that was their worry. But one thing I noticed immediately was stores were open on Memorial Day. And so I questioned that. I said, "That's a, this is a holiday. Now down here it isn't. That's a northern holiday. Oh, I said, we learned a whole new set of history. Our children learned history different than we learned. We learned about the northern aggression and, and we, we learned a lot of things we didn't know and still don't know. But be that as it may, over the years, Memorial Day has come to symbolize a time of remembrance, a time of looking back. All of us have markers and all of us are going to leave a legacy. Whatever else this day tomorrow might be, it's a time for remembrance, more specifically to remember people. A group of fellows went deer hunting. You know, when people go deer hunting, it's, it's, a, it's a business. It's not fooling around. It's not a hike in the woods. There's a purpose. And so they split up in twos. Eight guys, four groups of two. And they met back at the hunting camp and at the end of the day, this one guy was really a huffing and puffing and he had an eight point buck that he was bringing in all by himself and brought it in and the other guys looked at it and said, uh, where's Harry? Didn't Harry go with you? Oh yeah, he's back up there about a mile. Well, why isn't he with you? He had some kind of a tack, you know, some kind of a stroke or something, I don't know. They said, you brought the deer and you left Harry? He said, I didn't suppose anybody would steal Harry. <laughs> the moral of that story is that the deer was more important than the man. A dead animal was more important than a living human being. Now we laugh at that, it is kind of funny, but we live that way, don't we? There are times that we treat inanimate objects as more important than our neighbor and people around us and our family. 
Well, here's another one. You like that one so well. Super Bowl. I've never been to a Super Bowl. I don't think I've ever been to a football game anyway. I don't know much about it. I know they throw a ball and they run and, and they get points. But this guy was, he, he was in some prestigious seating at the Super Bowl. And there was a lady sitting there and next to her was a seat that was empty. And it was kind of strange because seats were at a premium and there really weren't any empty seats except right there was an empty seat. Said, I, I'm confused. And, what about this seat? Oh, she said, that belonged to my husband before he passed away. Oh, he said, I'm so sorry. He, he began to express his concern about it. He said, well, I would have thought some of the relatives would have jumped on that and got that seat. She, she said, I know, but they'd rather go to his funeral. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is people are more important than things. We tend to value things and use people, don't we? It should be the other way around. We should value people and use things. I heard this story about a fellow that liked to play pranks and jokes and stuff, and he was in a large department store back before there was a Walmart, but a store big. And he had fun. He went and took price tags and he changed them. He took inexpensive tags and put them on expensive goods and expensive tags and put them on cheap goods. You know what? That's exactly what the devil does takes that that is, value, that, that is valueless and tries to put a premium on it. Takes our life, tries to make us think it's worthless. He's done a good job of fooling us into thinking that the things of this world are more important than our relationship to people and to God. But I'm going to tell you this morning is that's not true. We have in our culture people that think that if an idea is old, it is no good. I agree that some old ideas are no good, but you know what? There are many things in life throughout the ages that have remained constant, that have stood the test of time, and one of those is Christianity. Proverbs twenty-two twenty-eight says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Keep that in mind. You see, they would give each tribe or family a particular section of land and boundary markers that we talked about. Piles of stones would mark the dimensions of that person's territory. Deuteronomy says, you shall not remove your neighbor's landmark, which the men of old have set, and your inheritance, which you will inherit in the land of the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Like I said, there were those that were greedy that wanted more. They would move the, their landmarks. So I want to tell you that throughout the past couple of decades, people have been dishonest. They've been moving and removing landmarks of our nation. You may think it doesn't really matter that they've torn down statues, but that's the landmarks. Those are reminders. You may think it doesn't matter that they've changed the wording in some of our uh, books and learning, but it matters. It happens gradually, but it happens. And much like moving a physical landmark, we eventually begin to notice and say things are different. I remember when denominations and groups have moved and moved and eventually removed the landmarks of Christianity. I don't have a hobby horse to ride, if you know what that means, but I was astounded at the Methodist Church because our roots go back to Methodism, back to John Wesley. And they removed about all the landmarks. If Mr. Wesley were to be able to come back and visit the Methodist Church, he would not recognize it. All the landmarks are gone. Many of the mainline churches no longer believe the Bible. They excuse it and explain it away. 
A lot of times people ask this question, what will it take to get this nation back on track? Well, I'm going to tell you it's going to take more than a slogan to make America great again. Amen. It's going to take revival. It's going to take a return to the old landmarks of Christianity. And people believe that if we do this or that, it will bring our nation back to greatness. Now, that's not what's missing. The landmarks have been destroyed. We need to get back to our moral values, our spiritual truths, the biblical basics. I suppose most everyone here knows who uh, Chuck Swindoll is. I remember listening to him many years ago, but just, just this week, I happened to cross, come across an interview with his daughter. I was shocked to realize that Chuck Swindoll is 88 years old. Very, very revealing interview. Talks about his early childhood and all through his life. But what I wanted to focus on, when he was in the military, he was in the Marines, and he was stationed in Okinawa. And also stationed there was somebody with the navigators. And they got together. And this guy that was with the navigators set uh, Chuck Swindoll up on a, a, a scripture memorization program that he diligently used throughout his time at, at, in the Marines at Okinawa. He made some landmarks. He established some boundaries. If you ever come across that interview, listen to it. It's, it's worth your time. It served him well for all the 88 years of his life. We need to get back to landmarks. Henry Wilson was the vice president under President Grant. This is what he said, it was 1866. Remember ever and always that your country was founded not by the best of all European races, but by the stern old Puritans who made the deck of the Mayflower an altar of the living God and whose first act on touching the soil to the new world was to offer on bended knees thanksgiving to Almighty God. The early church developed a summary of Christian beliefs. We could say it was there, this is what we believe statement. Let me read it to you, see if you're familiar with it. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. The Holy Catholic Church is the church universal. That's what he's saying there. And while the church has been sleeping, the enemy has been removing the landmarks. The first landmark they removed was the virgin birth of Christ. Our forefathers said, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. People dispute that today. They try to discredit the deity of Christ. I'm going to tell you that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. And that only can happen through the virgin birth. John said it like this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what does the virgin truth birth mean? It means that Jesus entered into the stream of humanity without any mediation of an earthly father. He was born as a result of the supernatural God. Let me tell you the second landmark, and I'm hurrying through this. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose from the dead. You mean to tell me that somebody that died 2,000 years ago on a cross was buried and raised again, that's what's going to save me? It doesn't sound logical, it sounds stupid. Listen to what Paul said. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jesus has nailed our sin to the cross. 
He's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he went to the cross, he took on himself the sin of the world. The third and final landmark that I want to share with you this morning is that of the crown. Paul is writing to his spiritual son, Timothy. He said, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, finally, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Peter said it like this, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. So I want to share with you in closing, the king is coming. He's coming back to reward those that follow him. As believers and Christians, we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. When Jesus left, he said, I'm coming back. His second coming will be personal. It'll be bodily. It will be visible. Not something you're going to miss. Not something that you're not going to be aware of. Every promise that he gave, he fulfilled, and I'm sure he'll fulfill this one too. We don't want to think about the second coming. They don't think he's going to come because everything is as it was. You know what? He is coming, and his coming is sooner than we realize. So in closing, let me say this. Remove not the ancient landmark Really, behind all of this, people are trying to remove Jesus. We must hold high Jesus Christ. He's the only hope for this world. Right. Gloria Gaither said, we need all the landmarks. We need stakes in the ground, altars that we build when God met us. Yeah. Times are hard. Life is difficult. Troubles come and doubts fill us to the point that we need to go back to the time and a place where we know that God met us for real. When we're dismayed and confused and defeated and bewildered by all this stuff that we call life, we can always look back to that point and to the time when beyond a shadow of a doubt, we know that God met us there and we can be confident that he walks with us now. I've asked Matt and his mother to come and sing the song, There's a Lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. I want you to think about that as they sing. There is, it's true, it's for us. the lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea when i'm tossed it sends out a light a light that i might see and the light that shines through darkness now will safely lead a sore if it wasn't for the lighthouse my ship would sail no more and i thank god for the lighthouse i hope 
my life to him jesus is the lighthouse and from the rocks of sin he has shown the light around me that i might clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse my ship would be no more now everybody that lives around us says tear that old lighthouse down the big ships they don't sail this way anymore there's no use in them hanging round but my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time i saw the light the light from that whole lighthouse that stands on a hill and i thank god for the lighthouse i hope my life to him jesus is the lighthouse and from the rocks of sin he has shown the light around me that i might clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse tell me where would this ship be sing it with us i thank god for the lighthouse i hold my life to him jesus is the lighthouse and from the rocks of sin he has shown the light around me that I might clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse where would this ship be sing it one more time I thank God for the lighthouse I hold my life to him Jesus is the lighthouse and from the rocks of sin he has shown the light around me that I might clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse tell me where would this ship be art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.